So, at my clock is three o'clock. <laughs> at least in Central Europe is three o'clock. <laughs> so it's time to start our first meeting of the first uh, season of 2022 of uh, online technology meetings. And uh, I can share. So, welcome everybody. <laughs> This is the first Epigola technology meetings of the new season. We are here to have technology discussions to solve your challenges. So please don't be shy. <laughs> is it also a new season for very different reasons? The, yeah, the best one is that it's just 2022. So I wish you a happy new year also from Epic for these meetings. But um, what we would like to do today is really to talk a bit first, a bit about Epic just so that those of you that don't know us can have a bit of an overview of what we are doing. But then we go deeper into the novelty film materials. That is what we, everybody here in the room wants to hear about. So when I start to talk about Epic, usually it's an easy one. I show this slide. <laughs> it's the 750 plus members. So 700 is an old re record that we had. And it's uh, the, them. So the logos there, you see the logos behind me. These are all these companies. Some of you are here in the room already as Epic members. Some of you are not. But we like really to, to increase the network, to talk to everybody that are photonics experts, but also integrators, material provider, end users. So that is why we are here. So to bring uh, Epic closer also to a community that is outside of Epic. So what I also would like to mention is that there is a little team behind all these 750 members, and we are trying hard to make you happy and to make also the photonics in Europe shining. And uh, what I would like to say today is a bit comparing what are the main tasks of Epic on one side and then the people so that all of you that maybe are experts with Epic uh, notice that maybe there are new people joining and you want to know a bit what they're doing. And that is important for us that you know what are the tasks, what are the, the needs. And so that where you can go, you can ask the right person. So the first one is technology. So technology is very important for us. So we want to have in Epic uh, the knowledge, the expertise in different fields. Photonics is so broad, but that's why we have a, a team that is dedicated to this, so from the technology side. Here I start with two people. The two people are in the room, let's say, moderating and guiding you today to this, into this uh, topic. So it's me, Francesca, and Antonio. Let's say I like to call us the, the laser guys <laughs> because we have both a laser background. So in, from my side, more um, laser development for uh, uh, scientific applications, but also spectroscopy, while Antonio is a, the, a very experienced uh, and uh, seasoned guy in the, in the uh, in laser industry and also for medical application of photonics. But this is, we are not alone. So in the team, there are also these other four people. I believe that many of you know already our CTO, so Jose Pozo is also there. And our, let's say, um, Omni, omni uh, expert in photonics, so pan, pan photonics expert, I like to call him, because he has, of course, a big overview and he helped building this, uh, this association and he's really the, a, a strong technology background from him and also a mentor for me. Um, but then we have also some new people. So the, the one on the bottom that you see, probably you noticed already, already soon in the last uh, couple of months, his name is Panagiotis, also called Panos, and he's our, let's say, more um, uh, quantum technology expert, but also in uh, expert in photonic integration. So he is our reference when you have these kind of topics of interest, and you will hear and see him more often also in the upcoming weeks. But then there are the two central guys that are really, really fresh. <laughs> and so I'm even welcoming them here officially. So welcome to Ivan and Jeremy. They are our, also extra two people in the, tech, in the technical team. And it's uh, uh, just for you to know. So Ivan has a, has a background in a semiconductor industry and also in photonics integration. So you will hear him and see him again more in um, basically dealing with these topics. And Jeremy. Is more like a, our high level guy. So he's an expert in uh, different uh, integration of uh, complex uh, systems uh, with optics, optronics, and also uh, lasers themselves. So he's our high level guy, <laughs> let's say high level integration. And you will hear from him as well very soon. Today is really his first day. So welcome, Jeremy. <laughs> Then I have a special moment for our technology and market data expert. So Tracy, very important to have her since a, a bit of more than a year. 
She's basically, if you remember, uh, uh, for those who knows Epic, uh, who know Epic, uh, we were providing since uh, yeah, uh, 2020 market data. That means market reports that were commercially available. We have still also many partners working with us. This is something that we still do. But since Trace is with us, we also provide special and unique market data that is available only for Epic members. And she's basically with a super background in engineering, electronics, and also in medical applications. She's the, let's say, behind the scenes the one that is coordinating um, all the experts to then provide this data that is uh, definitely an added value for EPIC members, members and based on what we think and what you think that are the most important topics uh, every year. So thanks a lot, Tracy. You will see her very often because she's also on the stage often. So you will see her soon as well. And um, it's great to have her as well. Then what EPIC does is also marketing support. So we do this for Epic members. We do this in a, uh, so for every uh, kind of activity when we you want to be increase a bit in visibility, we have here Anna, Auri, and Lisenda that can help you and also help us in working together also in European funded initiatives to uh, bring let's say the dissemination task uh, around. And um, what we would do is we, we do also in uh, in Epic is networking. So once in a, upon a time we were meeting all in person and we needed really a logistics expert to coordinate all the events and all the from the background also the locations. Now we have still Helena and Ringa. They maybe are less on site, but they are online, so they are also coordinating a lot of the activities here uh, in the online technology meetings and other online uh, events that we do. So without them, we would be lost. <laughs> Then last but not least, yeah, we have even a CEO, as this called Carlos. And I put here only investment as a task, but yes, of course, many more uh, high-level tasks, also thinking about um, the uh, financement and investment, not only for the company, but also a bit of lobby at the European level is also the one driving the, the, the strategy of EPIC coordinated with the, with the board of directors that we have. So definitely the person that is a bit very much behind the scenes, but also on, on stage very often to, to drive us together towards helping you as a EPIC community. What is important also for Carlos, but for all of us is that uh, um, you can find more people that are skilled in, in technology and especially in photonics. So that is one of the things we do is to promote this page here, jobsinphotonics.com. So if you are an Epic member and you wanted to advertise your, pay, your position open, we suggest you to add it here because we are trying to really bring a database that is always up to date and that is helping all the community together to find new and skilled people. So that is what I recommend you. Now maybe we go a bit deeper after this uh, introduction to EPIC to what is today about. So today is about uh, novels in film materials and is the first event, as I said at the beginning of a long calendar of online technology meetings that uh, the, we have more events in person, also other events that are more marketing oriented, but this is the calendar till end of June of all these kind of different technology meetings. Considering that this is a bit a well spread around topic. Uh, I, I hardly can uh, suggest you uh, some topics of the future that are really relevant for you, but I expect that some of you could be interested in the lighting for automotive that we have on 14th of February. Maybe someone is interested in single, in single photon sources and detectors that is in March. Maybe hybrid photonics integrated circuits is also someone interested in hearing about, in hearing about it. Uh, but the, the suggestion is, look, this is the, our web page. We update all the events there, not only the technology meetings, but all the activity of EPIC. And also very important, feel free to let us know what are your hot topics. That means it's something you really wanted to discuss because actually this meeting is a perfect example of this. So the, what our sponsor today is Coherent, and that is basically the originator of this meeting. So novelty film materials was a thing that was really important for Coherent. So Coherent, you know already, is a manufacturer of laser of different kinds for different applications for material processing, but also for um, research. So different application, but they are also employed in uh, puzzle laser deposition systems where you one of the technologies to generate a thin films. And so that's why we had this a strong idea to cooperate with Coherent and build up this uh, story uh, and this uh, meeting for you and for them and for everybody that is interested in this meeting. And I see from the 
the people who sign up, it's a, it's a hot topic, so it was a good choice. <laughs> so for those of you that uh, don't know the, the meeting, how it's running, we really promote a lot of discussion. And so please feel free to exchange yourself, your contact over the chat. Also, uh, for those um, on, um, on YouTube that maybe are interested, of course, you cannot ask directly, but then there is where I can come in. So if you're not sure how to connect to someone, also if you're watching the recording, because now welcome YouTuber, we are also on YouTube. So for those who are watching live, but especially those that are watching later, if you cannot really miss, um, if you couldn't find a way to connect to some of our uh, speakers or, or anyway participants, please feel free to contact me on one of these channels. So email, Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, this will be the thing that is uh, my role. So try to connect when uh, you didn't manage to connect yourself, but that's not a problem. That's why we are here. So now let's go a bit deeper. I, I announced already, I made already some teaser. We are talking about PLD, but not only. So the first three speakers are those that are a bit more oriented, PLD oriented, but then we will have also other three speakers later. And I believe they will introduce better themselves with their application because what I actually want to show you is what this is our, let's say, our strength, what we really love to, to show you is the supply chain. So this represents basically all the people who sign up today and their company, and we try to put them in, in their sector of interest in, in, the, in, the, in the topic of novel thin film materials. And in this case, I would say the system integrators, considering that thin films are a kind of a systematic um, part, relatively low in the supply chain. We have a lot of integrators, maybe not directly end users, but I like to call them system integrator and the consumer electronics, let's say, has a special uh, box where uh, these, uh, the people who sign up uh, belong to. But then, of course, there are two main blocks that are the thin film manufacturers and the manufacturing equipment. So we have people here that are interested in delivering directly the thin films, but also in delivering the machine themselves for different applications. Then there is a big block of materials, very important. A little part of optics, of course, because they are, they are here user, end user, adopters, depending on which hat they can wear. And then all the rest is, of course, part of the, of the value chain of this topic. And you are really welcome to, um, to be here and to also give your contribution, especially equipment and manufacturing, some testing and metrology. For example, I know it will be a hot topic. So let's not uh, forget that. <laughs> so now I will... Um, Better give the floor to the first speaker. That is actually, here we make a swap. I forgot the, the slide is better if I show this one again. This is the right one. So it's really my pleasure to introduce you then to our first speaker for TSSD, Rick Grönen. Please, Rick, now I stop sharing. The yes. floor is yours. <laughs> Here, let me see, share. Let me know whether this works. Yes, now then presentation mode. Yes. Yes, there you go. <laughs> right, thanks. Thanks for uh, offering this opportunity for us to present ourselves to this, uh, to the Epic community. Um, I would say not necessarily the, the, if you're thinking of our product and our, our customer base, it's more material science uh, focused, obviously. Um, it's interesting to see where we can maybe find some interesting collaborations indeed. So happy to, uh, to uh, present ourselves and, and the company and what we do. So personally, um, yeah, uh, my name is Rick Groenen. I'm the sales manager of TSST. Um, I have a quite a scientific background, obtaining my, my PhD also at the, here at the University of Twente, uh, closely located to, uh, to TSST, uh, focusing really on, on, on the science of pulse laser deposition. So uh, briefly, who we are, we are a thin film deposition equipment manufacturer, as you already uh, introduced, with a specific focus on, on pulse laser deposition. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, uh, we're um, in, in, in the east of the Netherlands, in the region Twente, the city of Enschede and the University of Twente, uh, might be a familiar name also, uh, is, is located uh, very close by. Um, we are originally also a spin-off from the material science group at, at the university. Uh, they really pioneered pulse laser deposition in, in the 80s, did a lot of developments from which we basically started as a as the machine builder. And currently we're actually a part of, of Demcon, might also be a familiar name, especially uh, Demcon Focal, the, the optomechatronics uh, system manufacturer. Um, and on the right side, a nice uh, kind of picture. Uh, that's our customer base, essentially. So we're really uh, doing uh, having customers globally, um, mainly in China and, and Europe, but also in, in the States, in India. Representation also in these overseas uh, areas. 
So what we offer um, is custom designed tin film deposition uh, equipment, uh, a nice design render on the right side. Uh, it's in, in essence, the core of a PLD machine is a, is a vacuum chamber. So it's always a vacuum chamber with a pump line, a certain amount of pumping. You, you want to, this process to be happening in a, in a clean uh, vacuum uh, conditions where you introduce uh, clean process gases. Um, and a lot of bells and whistles, uh, really depending on, on the requirements of the, of the customer, the type of scientific work they want to they do. So load logs, uh, diagnostic tools. Uh, well, obviously, the, the, the technique itself requires a, a substrate material, which a film is grown, a target material. So you have target and substrate manipulation. Uh, heating of substrate is very essential. We're growing crystals. So several types of heating in in let's say tough environment of oxygen, uh, high temperature. So th this requires really an engineering uh, approach. And we have, we have uh, several solutions to do this in a, in a very well controlled way. Um, and as I mentioned, quite a custom approach. So what, what you can see here on the bottom uh, from left to right on the left side, uh, you can see three systems connected to one uh, Exheimer beamline. Uh, so you can really address three different systems with one laser setup. In the middle, uh, as I mentioned, we not only do pulse laser deposition, but also other uh, deposition techniques. Uh, that's a nice example where we combine two systems with a, a load lock. So you can uh, change uh, and transfer uh, your grown samples between uh, several deposition techniques. And on the right bottom, a very nice example of a, a transfer line, a typical vacuum uh, solution. It's a six meter essentially a vacuum tube uh, where multiple systems are connected and you can really uh, move your sample from deposition technique to deposition technique to characterization technique without exposing it to, uh, to air. So these are very nice solutions. Well, next to the machines, also separate components, as I mentioned, especially heating. Um, we see a lot of demand on, on, uh, on our heating stages as this is, a, this is a, a really the core of the machine. And, um, and, and these designs need to be such that they really can handle these, these tough uh, conditions. Uh, but next to this, uh, I always like to mention that we, all, we, all, we offer support, and, but not only on the engineering part, the machine itself, but also scientific know-how. And, and we are originating from the university. We have a close collaboration with the university. And pulse laser deposition is really a technique where you optimize your parameters. There are quite a bit of parameters and you tune them. And, uh, and that's not entirely trivial. And, and, and we'd like to uh, offer our community base uh, um, kind of support in, in optimizing their, their parameter space. We also have quite a bit of scientific know-how on how to grow these, these films in the best way, so to say. Then diving a little bit into a PLD. It's the reason why I wanted to be the first speaker. I think it's quite useful also for the other speakers. So in essence, it's, it's a very straightforward pro process. You have three major components. The laser, we, we'd like to use an Exheimer laser typically. Uh, we're growing, PLD is really, is really good in growing complex uh, metal oxides. These, the, these are ceramics, so you need high power and, and uh, UV essentially because that, for the absorption of the material uh, of the light. So we, we'd like to use uh, the Exheimer laser. Uh, subsequently, a piece of optics to guide the beam uh, into the system and image uh, the beam onto a target. And on the left side in, in the schematic, you see the target and the substrate. So you, you just um, um, image the beam onto the target and you, in a pulsed way, you create this, this PLD plume, which you can nicely see in the animation uh, below. Um, one of the strengths of PLD is also really the flexibility of changing between targets. So you can load multiple targets. You can just by a push, a bu push a button, you change target materials. And this really gives you the flexibility of growing. And that's a very nice example on the right side, this cross-section TEM, uh, transmission electron microscope, image of a grown, what we call heterostructure. So several materials on top of each other. And it's an uh, atomic resolution. So you, you have the control with uh, certain diagnostics tools that you can introduce during the technique to really control monolayer growth. So you can see nine, 10 layers of this uh, lanthanum aluminate then strontium copper oxide, one thin layer. And then, so you can really play with these building blocks. So we really like to see this as kind of playing with Lego, Lego blocks. And this is really how the technique has evolved um, uh, over the year. Really requires obviously a, a good designed uh, machine. But on the, on the bottom, you can see this, this nice video. It's a very, quite an explosive process. So control over parameters is not too trivial, um, but also understanding the, the process actually to get these, these perfect films 
Um, so yeah, PLD itself has really so the, the, yeah has 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 let's say uh, is is widely used, and that our next speakers will be a very nice example of all the applications that are currently um, uh, there to where PLD is used. But we are really focusing on the scientific market, the TSST. So PLD has gone from yeah, doing atomic layer understanding material science on, on atomic level to, to really application-based sensors, energy harvesters, uh, uh, ITC superconductors, etc. So it's a really uh, a broad range um, of applications of the technique. Um, brings me back to kind of the the pitch towards the community. Um, I have been thinking about this indeed. So what is what is interesting in PLD is that although we grow these nice films, there is still a lot to be understood in terms of, of what really happens on a, on, a, on a fundamental level. And so, and it starts with controlling the ablation parameters. Okay, this plume forms and then the film grows. But this plume is not so trivial. All these, these elements are in there. So just di diagnostics of the plume is interesting to really grasp the process better. Um, so what do we want to know of this, this, this ablated plume? Uh, what species are in there? So it's, it's neutrals, it's ions, obviously, because it's a plasma. Uh, especially in the beginning, uh, but also the position of these, these elements, uh, spatial temporal distribution, the kinetics, the chemistry that's happening. So species tend to oxidize uh, during, so you have monoxides, dioxides. You can look at it at, at this plume. This is actually my, my personal PhD work with, with high-speed cameras. You can kind of image the plume, right? So you can see here the propagating plume. But as you saw in the video, it's really explosive. You're talking about a microseconds of... of, of um, of, of time scales in which the plume really propagates uh, the videos. So, okay, so this, this is imaging, looking at the plume, you can spectrally resolve the light of the plume. So here you can see a spectrum wavelength on the x-axis and you can see really the spectrum changing. So it already gives you an indication of change in chemistry of the plume. Um, and next to the, but the thing with emission spectroscopy is always you rely on the light that's being emitted from the plume. And typically in the conditions that we grow with PLD, relatively high oxygen pressures, the plume thermalizes, so you lose the light. So you could think of fluorescence techniques, which we also um, developed during my, my PhD with the laser physics group at the university. We would have a second narrow banded laser set up, um, which would uh, make species in the plume fluoresce, basically. So what you see here is a very nice image where on the right side, you see self-emission, the whole plume. And uh, specifically titanium species, this was a strontium titanium oxide plume. You could see where the, no, the titanium was located in the, in the plume. And this gives really interesting physics. You really can get a, uh, a better mapping of where all the species are and, and eventually relate this to your film growth and optimizing parameters and understanding the process. So I would say kind of, the, this is the current state of, of, of doing plasma diagnostics and i would just throw out the question to the community like could we think of uh, yeah optical techniques to to uh, to improve these type of diagnostics such a dye laser setup is a really elaborate uh, lab full of, of of laser equipment you guys know more about this probably than than me um for, as a company we, we would be interested in in kind of plug and play diagnostic tools to be plugged onto the to the PLD machine to, for instance, perform these type of fluorescence uh, techniques. Maybe there are other techniques uh, that would be my kind of pitch towards um, towards the Epic community. So yeah, I'd like to, I think I completely, uh, <laughs> this was longer than six minutes, but uh, uh, yeah, I will just leave this slide on and hopefully I've given a nice introduction on, uh, on PLD and, and TSST as a company. Thanks a lot, Eric. It was oh, good. It was good. You were not too late. I was too late as well. So let's be both too late. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It was really great. And it is the epic question. So what can you do for them? You mentioned it, of course, taking, talking about the technology. And this is what the community can do for you. So now the question is, are there some people here in the room that can support Rick in this right now or can shoot some ideas? Are you there? <laughs> Because you know, if you don't do it, I will pick people, and then you have to be prepared. <laughs> That's <laughs> what we usually do. <laughs> I think. Now, maybe you can. Know, you know what you can do. You were mentioning that during your your time in your PhD, right? You were already focusing mostly on the Florence's technology, right? So maybe you can give some of the challenges that you saw there 
that mm. should be really more specifically on the technology helping also other other uh, yeah. that are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. It's a good point, and I already kind of ducked this question. So as yeah. I mentioned, it, it was a collaboration with a laser physics group, so it was really a different PhD project mm -hmm. that did all these fluorescent studies. I'm okay. uh, mostly I. I I focus on, on, on the material science or so growing the films. So basically we would overlap in, in the conditions in which I would grow films uh, and would define interesting per parameter spaces. He would start looking into uh, understanding these fluorescence techniques. But what I do know is it's it's all about getting narrow banded enough. Uh, you you want to excite all the species. So make sure that you fully expose all the, all the species. Um, uh, you need to be in saturation of the species that are, that are in there. Um, so the requirements of the laser setup is is uh, not so trivial and pretty tr intricate. And then building, it's it's all about right timing, right? So uh, you create a plume, and then this slab of light needs to be timed correctly. These are to some extent engineering challenges. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a again, it's a it's a um, a dye laser uses well, chemicals that you prefer maybe not to to use, right? These are uh, but again, this, this is the community knows more about this than. Um, then I saw, yeah, we, we, we have been thinking of, of can we think of, of simple solid state kind of lasers that you put on the system, but have the energy and have the, I guess, narrow bandedness, um, which, which there, therefore gives you these type of fluorescence uh, information on, on specific species. That's... Um, One other thing I would like to ask you is how online... Can so in line definitely you said you would like to mount it on together with your in your facility basically in your PLD uh, um, system, but how much direct information is to be done? So how um, online uh, information are important and what can be instead maybe told later on because the diagnostic done doesn't have to be done directly while the Lego piece is coming mm -hmm. <laughs> as you call it. Yeah, that's a good point. So you need to do in the, in the end it's. <laughs> you you need to understand you need to, it's not and it's not easy easily answered so so you find yourself in a position that you will get the information and you will you will maybe find that you need to tune a certain parameter so this tool will give you a certain signal and that that and that corresponds to the best film or so and then you can start thinking of okay so what type of model could i what, what does this mean the fact that a certain species need to have a certain density. Maybe, maybe I mean, fluorescence techniques in the in in the in the best case, in combination with the absorption spectroscopy, you can really start mapping um, almost absolute densities. Uh, this was difficult, but for certain species, we have been able to do this. Absolute densities. I mean, now we're really talking about the, the actual amount of species that arrive, and mm -hmm. we know that that the, the 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 optimum window is so material dependent. So we we. For every material system, you need to find yourself tuning the parameters uh, again in PLD, and that ma mainly means the oxygen in the chamber, and let's say, uh, for instance, the, the fluence of your laser on the target. Th these affect uh, the, the, the species. So you, you will get a better feeling maybe for the chemistry that's happening. So I don't see it as an, you, you won't immediately get a response. It's really, we need to find out which, which are, what is actually the physics that we need to tune on. What is the characteristics of the plume? that we need to control to, 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 to understand this film growth better. Um, yeah, uh, slightly vague, but... No, uh, no, no, I guess you it's... You see my uh, point. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> no, no, it's not vague. It's definitely some device that you, you can give already inputs to that, the yeah. expert. And, uh, and uh, if we don't have them here, in the room, that is the good point. We will have it afterwards, and uh, that is, is good to give the most details you can. Of course, mm. you're allowed to to engage a bit then in the future with uh, uh, some of our uh, uh, people that can connect to us and connect to you and the, yeah, sure. the, the, the teaser for this. So don't worry for the vagueness. It's always yeah. very important. <laughs> so for, what I can do at the moment is just uh, maybe introduce some of the um, meteorology experts in general. So we have someone in the room that is maybe dedicated more on the post processing. So on when the, the film is already deposited and maybe this is now the time to give the floor. I know is not uh, um, an institute technology expert, but nevertheless, it would be nice for me to give the floor to Taras from Ascent Optics to give at least an overview to those who talk about metrology and want to check their film at the end, what is that Ascent Optics can offer. Can 
can offer. Tara thank you. I see your camera on. Microphone still off. So now you just need to <laughs> switch on the microphone and introduce yourself. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Francesca. It's really a pleasure to be here and to see everyone uh, so happy. Um, my name is Saros. I'm CEO of Ascent Optics. And I will grab a few moments of your time to briefly discuss what we can do for the team, for the EPIC team, actually. We uh, design and develop metrology systems for actually for optical thin film metrology systems, mainly spectral photometers, which are used to measure transmission and reflection uh, of thin film coatings from UV to mid-wave infrared, namely from 185 nanometers up to 5.2 micron uh, in a single tool. And we can do this fully unattended uh, at different angles and different polarizations, S and P, with a very good resolution, I mean, spectral resolution. And we are capable to do this even more for very small samples, like five millimeter samples. This is our core uh, focus uh, of our company. And uh, we do this very well. We serve customers all around the globe. And the two main questions from Epic, what can we do for you, obviously, is we can definitely provide um, very good technology, very good metrology uh, systems for your optical thinking coatings. And uh, what can you do for us? Obviously, you can challenge us with your puzzling questions, and we'll be very much happy to dig deeper into them and try to find a solution. And maybe uh, we're also looking for a very advanced light sources from UV to infrared. And if anyone can suggest uh, light sources with a very high density, we'll be very much happy to discuss this with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tara. So you even ask really the, the, the real epic questions. You answer them with the, <laughs> the real things we want to I hear. Know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, you were not online for a while, but you didn't forget the, the spirit. So thanks a lot, sure, Tara, sure. for this. My pleasure. Yeah, so it's not directly the answer to Rika. This we knew already, but this is someone, so Essent Optic, you can always refer to. And well, laser manufacturer that with high uh, density for, for Essent Optics, we have also in the room, if someone wants to comment, is of course welcome. But if it's not, let's say, Rick, we keep your questions um, pending, let's say, so people will see it also on YouTube. There will be time to uh, think about it and maybe put you in contact with someone that I have in mind that maybe is not in the room today, but they will be happy to help you. For the moment, let's listen a bit more on applications, as also you announced. It's maybe the time to move forward, and we go to Antacon. So it's really my pleasure to, do, to, do, to give the floor now to Hagen Grutna, and there is coming. Yeah, there you go. The floor is yours, Agna. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Hagen Grutna. Uh, our company is called Antacon. It's a spin-off from the University of Applied Sciences, but wider. And what we are offering are customized DLC coatings for wheel protection under extreme conditions. <clears throat> First of all, um, let's talk about DLC in general. If you look here on the right side, uh, DLC is classified by the amount of SP3 or diamond uh, content. The, uh, DLC uh, is diamond like carbon. Um, it's also classified by the amount of incorporated hydrogen. And what we are doing is to deposit TAC, it's tetrahedral amorphous carbon, a special type of diamond-like carbon with no uh, hydrogen incorporated and with a maximum amount of diamond bonds. That means uh, our layers have a maximum hardness. We can go up to 70 gigapascal. That means we have about 70% of diamond hardness. And a special feature of our layers is that we have nearly zero intrinsic stress. And uh, that gives us the, the opportunity to deposit layers with no limit, limitation in thickness. So this is quite new. Uh, another advantage of our films is that we have a really low average roughness of less than 100 nanometers. That means a low friction coefficient and that makes our uh, layer suitable for uh, triple logical applications. Now let's come to a problem you always have. 
if you deposit this uh, TAC films, you always have a high amount of intrinsic stress. Uh, we measure, measure that uh, using the substrate bending, stony equation, and you can see if you deposit uh, the layers at parameters where you get the maximum amount of uh, diamond bonds, uh, these layers have high intrinsic stress, and this stress is uh, generating forces, and these forces make the uh, layers instable, and in the worst case, they are delaminating from your substrate or from your tool. So uh, we invented uh, a process to get rid of this intrinsic stress. We are using a two-step process. The first step is typical PLD of a graphite target. We are using an eczema laser. And after a few nanometers of TAC growing with high internal stress, we use the second laser. It's also an eczema laser and irradiate uh, the growing film. And this uh, is a laser pulse annealing process where we uh, put down uh, the internal stress to 0 0.1 gigapascal. That's nearly zero, uh, let's say. And so we are able to generate these layers in any desired thickness and with high mechanical stability. Uh, now let's have a short look at the microstructural properties. You can see two things here. By varying the ablation fluence, we are able to uh, have control of the, uh, on the SP3 content. That means we can directly control the hardness of our resulting layer. And the second thing is, uh, if you look at the yield spectra here, uh, the annealing process doesn't change anything in the SP3 content. That means we have no internal stress, but the maximum hard TAC layers. So that's a new thing uh, about our company. So what's the challenge? Uh, yeah, the challenge is to upscale uh, this, this uh, process for industrial use. Um, we will install a 300 hertz uh, laser system from Coherent uh, to get factor six uh, of output uh, in comparison to what we have now. And what we are also planning is to install a two target solutions, uh, solution with two 300 hertz lasers to double the outcome uh, due to this step. Now, what we are looking for is, uh, of course, interested customers. Uh, we are also looking for new applications and interested partners uh, to scale up our business. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your introduction of the technology. And now I see there is something that is missing, Hagen. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? So can you maybe say a little bit what is possible to be done for you? And then we go to Jeremy. <laughs> oh, for me, uh, it would be nice uh, to get to know uh, some new, new faces, uh, new people uh, in the area or in the field of PLD. Also, maybe potential customers or maybe problems I don't think about uh, where, where our layers can be helpful, maybe. And yeah, this would be nice. And yeah. <laughs> That's it's very good to know. So now we have we have your 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 wish list of a possible application, and this is also always a, a challenge to you. We have maybe the overview of your known applications, but maybe there is someone that can, uh, let's say, provoke you and uh, give you some new challenge for a new for a new theme film material or a theme film uh, application. But uh, yeah, thanks a lot. So now maybe Jeremy, you had the hand raised. Maybe you can ask your question or comment. <laughs> Yes, I did. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you, Hagen. Very, very nice presentation. Uh, on, on your last slide, I saw a very specific item in the pictures um, in the center. It looked like uh, you, you can code as well um, focusing tubes for the abrasive water jet machining. Is this correct? Uh, let's have a look at the presentation. I don't know. You can share it again, eh? uh, again, no problem. And then we maybe, Jeremy can guide you. <laughs> Or maybe maybe a more general question: Can you code internal diameters? And um, and have you done this before? And is this something that you do generally to to code internal diameters on long channels? Uh, I didn't understand the question. I think so. If you have a long channel, uh, can yeah. you code the inside? Inside coding. Yes. Oh no, that's that's a problem. Uh, if you use PLD in general, I think. 
because your particles are strongly directed uh, to your substrate and uh, the coating of, of a tube in the inside is really hard because the particles will not see uh, your surface and the surface will not see the particles. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good, yeah, then, it, then you see, you wanted a challenge and now <laughs> that That's is a big one. <laughs> Um, uh, concerning what Rick was telling us before, so do you have some demands about the, the diagnostic as well, or where do you see that maybe you could be more efficient and optimize the, the, the full uh, facility to, to get maybe higher quality or higher throughput? Do you see there some open question for improvement? Um, if we had a, a simulation for the, the film growth, uh, referring to your, your growth rate on your substrate, so that we don't need to do experiments if we have new tools or things like that. So we also always have to test what's the growth rate, what's the homogeneity and, and so on. And if we had a, a simulation for that, uh, would be great. Yeah. Ah, so you see that oh. you have a shopping list. <laughs> ah, can you rest, have it? <laughs> the rest of the process, I think, is quite clear for us. Okay, yeah, but simulation is good. Eh? Some of our members, maybe someone also is listening uh, here on YouTube. Uh, that is a good, good hint because there is definitely also in the in our yeah in our community definitely someone that can uh, support you also from R and D centers. Maybe if someone already here wants to raise a hand, of course, please free, feel free to talk to him directly or maybe just introduce yourself. But uh, this is a good thing that uh, to throw in the room. So simulation for yeah for seeing let's say the. Uh, the growth of the of the film. That's uh, very good to know. And maybe now that um, if there are no other questions, I would like maybe to, you know, we are here to also know each other. And I maybe would like to ask some of our laser manufacturers. So I see we have Luis Rafael from Femtum in the room. And I would really like to know how is he doing first <laughs> and also what he is doing and why he's interested in this uh, in this meeting. Thank you, uh, Luis Rafael. <laughs> yes, uh, very gr great talk, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today. So I'm the co-founder and CEO of Femta. We are a spin-off company manufacturing the first uh, generation of uh, mid-infrared uh, short pulse fiber lasers. Uh, I'm here uh, today to understand uh, basically PLD and uh, half our lasers can, uh, let's say, could work with any uh, new partners. Uh, we have done a lot of work on thin film patterning. Uh, any transparent uh, conducted films, uh, basically we have been able to pattern them very efficiently and quickly. Uh, we have very nice results. Uh, I can just show you perhaps uh, a one, uh, let's say a, a one pager on our website. Absolutely, yeah, Great. go ahead. <laughs> you know, you have to, yeah, there's something is coming. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Are you seeing this yes, now? Yes, we see yeah, the, sure. the So the I website. just wanted to uh, promote our blog. Uh, we like to, you know, uh, make some uh, show results. And uh, with our lasers, basically, we can do true substrate. Uh, and it can be any, it can be semiconductors, it can be glasses, it can be uh, polymers. And we don't affect uh, such materials. So we don't affect the substrates. And we can really be selective. So anything that is related to uh, either ablating uh, or annealing, uh, the main, main reason why Femtum, basically, it's, uh, it's uh, the fact that we are pulsed. Uh, we are also fiber lasers, so uh, very robust and long lifetimes. But the, really, the main thing is that we have new wavelength. So uh, 2.8 micron to 3.4 micron, it's really targeting the OH and the CH or any hydrogen bonds uh, with molecules. So if you find anything like uh, into this uh, interesting, uh, we are here uh, you know, to talk and discuss. Very good. Thanks a lot, Luis Rafael. That's uh, very interesting to let you a bit know also into the community in not uh, in, in also other application of your lasers. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the wavelength is interesting. Yeah, mid IR is uh, the boom now. So <laughs> let's exactly. mention that this is also possible. <laughs> exactly. And just to let you know, so for some application, uh, let's say the other candidate was let's say FEM2 UV. And you know, those lasers are very expensive. Uh, and uh, we have been able to do the same thing. Uh, but a lot more cheaper and more uh, robust. So it, um, it, it's uh, just to give you some insight. So normally when, when it's absorbing in the UV, there's a lot of absorption also in the mid IR. Uh, it's the other place where it absorbs and where we can be very selective. 
every tool for every need, I would exactly. say. So <laughs> that's what Epic can do as well. So serve the right technology. <laughs> so I've seen that there was an innovation that was uh, popping up. Maybe it was a mistake in case you want to introduce yourself or ask a question, maybe uh, take your time to think about it. But maybe we go first to the next speaker if there are no other questions from you. Another PLD, PLD expert. So, but now in uh, some special materials, well, you are all talking about the novel materials, but uh, let's Let's see what uh, Alexander has to say today. So, Alexander, if you are ready. Yes, I am. There you Can are. You see my the floor is yours. Yes. If you go to presentation yeah, mode, perfect. Yes. There you go. Okay. So, uh, our company is S Innovations and it's part of a larger company group named Superox, and we are located in Moscow, Russia. And uh, we make superconducting materials. So, for my talk today I chose the as the title I chose uh, the motto of our company group superconductor to the future um, so this busy slide shows the structure of our material where the uh, main component, the main functional component the superconductor uh, is the uh, complex oxide of yttrium barium and copper uh, in short YBCO and it, it is superconducting when cooled with liquid nitrogen. So uh, the essence of superconductivity is that the electrical resistance is zero, but also in addition to that, it's not only uh, not almost no electrical losses to conduct electricity. Uh, it also possesses very high current density. So it can transmit in this cross section, it can transmit hundreds times more current than copper. That's why this material is so important and so attractive for applications. So uh, the product is a multi-layer coating on a metallic substrate. The metallic substrate is a uh, few tens to 100 nanometers thick. And then on top of it, we, we deposit several coatings. First, some uh, very thin oxides that prevents chemical reaction between the superconductor and the substrate. We call them buffer layers. And we deposit these buffer layers by a number of uh, vacuum deposition techniques, mostly magnetron sputtering and electron beam evaporation. And then on top of the buffer layers, we grow a few micron thick film of the superconductor. And we do this by pulsed laser deposition. That's, that's why I'm talking this meeting, thank you very much for inviting me. Then on top of the superconductor, we deposit a protective layer of silver or a couple of microns thick, and then uh, some copper to provide electrical stabilization so that the current can flow from the superconductor into copper in case we lose uh, cooling and uh, the superconductor turns non-superconducting. So as I've said, this material can transmit a lot of electricity without electrical loss. And this is the equipment we use to deposit the superconductor, the pulsed laser deposition machine. And yes, uh, this material is a really long tape of a few hundred meters long. So all the production, all the processing is done uh, by transmitting, by transporting the tape through the machines in the real-to-real -real mode. So the tape is moving while the uh, thin layers are being deposited onto it. And one of the processes is the fast laser deposition. Uh, we use coherent lasers of the LEAP family 130C and 300C. They're chlorine lasers and the, their UV lasers. So uh, if you ask me what we need to improve in terms of uh, photonics, for our future development is we are really looking for lower cost per pulse from the lasers. Uh, to uh, give you some feeling of the, uh, of the applications of these materials. So uh, naturally these materials are needed where there is high power density, where we want to save electricity and when we want to generate high magnetic fields. Uh, there are some applications that are enabled by high temperature superconductors, such as fault current limiters. They are 
analogs of circuit breakers for large grids. And also only with high temperature superconductors, one can achieve very high magnetic field in excess of 16 Tesla. Uh, this includes a uh, very hot topic now, compact reactions for fusion, uh, ma magnets for particle accelerators and magnets for uh, NMR. There are some technologies where we can replace uh, conventional conductors with high temperature superconductors and achieve great improvements. And these are cables for power transmission, uh, coils in the rotating machines for aircraft propulsion, for ship propulsion, for, uh, for uh, generators. Uh, in uh, MRI magnets, we can replace low temperature superconductors with high temperature superconductors and uh, our material can also be used for magnetic levitation. Out of all these applications, I wanted to give you an example of uh, the application that is driving our market today, and this is compact fusion. Uh, I borrowed this slide from the company Commonwealth Fusion Systems uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and they're developing this application of uh, very compact uh, fusion reactor of the tokamak design, where by using our material, they can generate ultra high magnetic fields up to 20 Tesla. And by using these ultra high magnetic fields, then can, can make a tokamak compact uh, compare, comparing to the size of a human. Whereas uh, a well-known ITER project uh, run by a number of governments uh, is probably 20 times the size of this. And this compact magnetic field fusion uh, can be achieved by a private company like Commonwealth Fusion Systems, but they are not the only ones. I'm using them as an example. So uh, when they entered the scene a few years ago, they said, a very challenging target for the performance of our material. They wanted even higher uh, engi uh, engineering current density from the material that, than what could be achieved a few years ago, which our company, S Innovations, successfully achieved. So now we can make this material and we can manufacture it. So we enable uh, this initiative. CFS have already won one coil and demonstrated this year the field of 20 Tesla in the coil. So now the next step is to make a magnetic system out of 18 such coils and build the tokamak. And they're bringing to the industry, to our industry, another challenge. The industry really need to scale up and achieve the capacity that it didn't have before of thousands of kilometers of this material produced per year. And then as in five years from now, this demonstration pilot device is built and when they need to scale up to a commercial uh, device from the prototype, uh, they would really need to bring down the cost, which we are working on right now. So this chart here shows the development of uh, our production capacity during the last 10 years. And as you can see, we, since uh, 2017, in a few years, we increased our capacity in response to the demand from high field fusion 10 times, and we're scaling up more. So right now, we're commissioning the equipment that we received uh, in December, 2021, and uh, now, thanks to this PLD technology, which is very scalable and very reproducible. Our company has become the leader of the market for high temperature superconducting material. And uh, we're enjoying this position and uh, we're proud to be the leaders. So here I'm going to, uh, to end my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks a lot, Alex. Thanks a lot for introducing your activities. And of course, I mean, I love the energy application. I, I've seen it already in your slide and it was already like the, the wow effect for me. <laughs> Big fan of, of hearing if that is becoming something real. Uh, for a real uh, energy source. And um, what I'm asking you now is a bit the more, what can you do, they do for you? So there is there something also based on the challenges you heard from your fellow colleagues, let's say in the PLD world, is it something that the photonics can really help you with to, to support you? So you mentioned already um, that you would like to have in a, most, a more efficient, uh, let's say cost per pulse, let's yes. say. Can you be, a bit define this? Do you see, okay, on the source, I guess it's clear, but do you see something like on the optics or on the beam transport that can, could help you in optimizing and helping the laser manufacturer to be more efficient? Do you see there's some room for uh, improvement? Um, well, of course, there's always room for improvement. Uh, perhaps it's, it, well, we'll enjoy it if we get it, let's say, uh, less energy loss of the beam on the way from the laser to the to the PLD chamber. So clear optics and uh, yeah, more efficient uh, energy transfer would help us too. Uh, it's not that it's too inefficient right now. Uh, most of the of the beam energy is getting into the chamber, but still, of course, we're losing 10 to 20% on the way. It depends on the um, uh, on the optics design, on the optical path design, but also, of course, on the on the components. But going forward and uh, and scaling up, because uh, I just presented to you one main driving application, right? Fusion. Uh, okay. If they're successful, they will want thousands of those reactors. The market be so huge; it's difficult to imagine for us at this time because we're only, you know detaching from the from, from the zero uh, and then of course the more efficient the more cost efficient the lasers are the more competitive our technology to make this material will be so yeah the the main the main challenge now as we see it is to make the lasers cheaper for us thanks a lot alex so maybe I, we ask then in the room, we have Ralph from Coherent. So I maybe ask you what is the, let's say, availability of Coherent to collaborate also with the fellow companies that could bring then a, a, most, a more efficient, um, let's say, cost per pulse for, for your end user. I assume yeah, you have some strategies with the optics that, as I mentioned, but if you have want to throw something that is a bit of a challenge to help the Excimer laser manufacturers, this would they be helpful. <laughs> so. So you mentioned me, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, of course, um, we are well well aware of of the business of this business and uh, in good contact, of course, with S Innovations, and uh, we have definitely a roadmap towards uh, better performance cost. Um, yeah, costs of, of high power XMA lasers, so we can scale up the power further, and of course, we at the same time want to reduce costs or the, the performance, improve the performance costs. And that is definitely on our roadmap. And uh, yeah, so I cannot tell too much uh, here uh, because it's a uh, company secrets, Absolutely. but uh, <laughs> there's definitely not the end of the road achieved with the Leap 300C, which is now in full production at S Innovations. And uh, yeah, we, we want to be definitely a part of this uh, amazing success, success story. and. Uh, yeah, that, that's a really big thing and uh, yeah. Good it's really interesting for me. Offer. Yeah, that is really interesting for me also yeah. to hear that you're ready to support even a larger production. Let's see if this is uh, one of the applications that is really going into an explosion because that yeah, is right. uh, what we hope also, also for uh, our uh, planet, <laughs> most probably to give some energy that is a bit cleaner than uh, what we have now. But um, now, if uh, there are there other questions, other comments for Alexander? Because if uh, Agner is still there, 
we have the YouTube questions that I didn't see maybe on time, but I still see it now, thanks to my collaborators. <laughs> and uh, you said, so we have Yuga Lof here, our, uh, my personal augmented reality uh, informer. So having him on LinkedIn is uh, really nice to have. So you will, uh, thank you for, for being there and being so present. He's asking a question to Hagen. So the question is, um, can you achieve various colors of DLC? And then at what thickness will you coat, will be your coating black? This is the question. Coating black, yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in general not what we want to uh, produce uh, because uh, if you have really black uh, DSA coatings, the graphite content is quite higher. So we are able to, to lower the SP3 content or, or make a higher SP2 content. I would say about two microns and we get a quite black uh, layer if necessary, or yeah, if, if the customer wants to have a black layer. But the hardness is going down uh, at this point. Yeah, and the first part of the question, I couldn't hear. Uh, it was, uh, can you achieve various colors of DLC? Yeah, various colors uh, are possible. Uh, because uh, of the high SP3 content, you get really brilliant uh, colors, every color you like, green, blue, uh, or other colors, but the thickness then will be only a few 100 nanometers. So it's, it's nice for, for an optical effect, but uh, not really suitable for, for wheel protection uh, things, I think, yeah. But colors are possible, yeah. Very good. So let's see if... Uh... It's Yuval, we'll have some uh, back question. Otherwise, he knows now, he knows that he can come back to you also privately. So thanks a lot, Agen, for the, for the answers. I know, yeah, he thinks about black coatings as well. So that's, uh, I know where, he, where he's going. So <laughs> that was a very good question. So thanks a lot. So if there are other questions, PLD related, of course, we can take them later. If you have a last thought, a last uh, thinking, a last maybe proposal to do, you're very welcome to do it. We are still here for an hour, but now it's maybe time to be a, go a bit further. So we heard about um, application in, in the energy production field. Is it uh, for me a really, a, really a, a big pleasure to, to, have, to manage to drive forward to this uh, topic, also talking about photovoltaic. And I'm really glad that we have here uh, Gang Xiong from First Solar. And uh, I'm really looking forward to your talk. So I will shut up now and just give you the floor. <laughs> Gang, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I have to say you're a fantastic uh, facilitator. Um, Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes just talk about the same film, uh, PV uh, uh, manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> so for solar, we are the, the biggest uh, same film PV uh, manufacturing company uh, in, the, in the world. Um, so we, uh, we have, uh, we're gonna have a 17 gigawatt of uh, annual capacity by 2025 and right now we're roughly like eight gigawatt per year and we already build like a 30 gigawatt of uh, solar modules uh, and uh, what does this mean basically we're talking about replacing roughly 30 uh, mid-size uh, co-firing uh, power plants so we, we are a global company our headquarters is in uh, <coughs> Arizona, uh, United States, and uh, we have a uh, uh, manufacturing in uh, in in US, uh, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and we are also building a factory in, in India. We are uh, we have an advanced research center in in California, and uh, we also have a, a quite a few uh, global uh, <coughs> sales office, in, including uh, uh, office in Europe and uh, some other operation in, in Germany. Uh, of course, uh, we have a very strong partnership with uh, many uh, European equipment vendors, such as uh, coating companies or other like a uh, laser uh, and, and other companies as well. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit uh, of the the our uh, film stack and cell and module. Then, then later I will, I will talk about you know, how the entire process uh, looks like and the one metrology we're going to use. So, 
So basically, uh, if you talk about Synthon, Solar, and by the way, all, all they actually looks quite a, uh, like each other in, in, in terms of the stack. So typically you, you would put, put a, uh, you know, TCO on a glass substrate, uh, and then you, you, you have an absorber layer, which is typically uh, like a couple of micron semiconductors, and, and then uh, uh, a lot of, like, for example, a P-type contact, contact layer and a metal, metal electrode, right? So this is basically uh, uh, how the field stack looks like. And uh, typically, for our case, uh, it could be like a 20 to 30 layers. Uh, and then you, we do the laser scribing to allow the, the cell to cell interconnect. So there are three laser scribing process. One, one is etching all the way uh, uh, through the TCL. This is the isolation scribe. And then a lot of ones uh, etching through the, uh, towards the TCL. And then you deposit the metal layer to, 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 to uh, allow the interconnect. And then the, the third one called P3 is cast through the, 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 the metal layer. Uh, so on the left side, this is the, the film stack and cell interconnect. On the right side, this is how the module looks like, right? Uh, for, to make a module, you, you need to add a ladder process that, that's called lamination. So you put, put some interlayer, then uh, on top of that, you put a cover glass. So our standard uh, module size is roughly 1.2 by 2 meter, uh, just to get you an uh, idea. <laughs> so let's how the, uh, the entire manufacturing process looks like. Uh, so, so this is basically an in-night process. And it, it typically it takes roughly three to four hours from uh, incoming TCO glass and, and to be coated and then go through some uh, film uh, leading steps and, uh, and then uh, we do the spatter back contact layers. And, and of course we have all the laser scribing process, P1, P2, P3 to, to uh, make the interconnect. And, and then after we do the nomination uh, and then you put the cover glass on and then we uh, can make a module. So. It, Overall, it takes roughly three to four hours. Uh, of course, we use a lot of inline metrology to make sure the process is under control. Uh, there are like a sense such as uh, integrated video systems to, to uh, just to check whether there, there are defects for uh, 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 each given module and the other metrologies like a basin and the frame qualities and the scribing metrology. Uh, of course, a lot of also like a film metrology such as cyclist right, or, or uniformity uh, uh, and glass stress and shape. Uh, and also if, if glass is broken, how do, how do we detect that and how do we prevent the, the equipment from being shutting down? Uh, so there are actually quite some uh, 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 videos, e either uh, Vimeo or, or YouTube, you can look at it. Uh, so you just basically you, you search for solar manufacturing, you can find, find uh, like uh, videos on how, how, how we actually process a module. Um, <clears throat> last one, uh, so speak of um, uh, uh, innovation or, or, or since we, we may need help, right? So, uh, Basically, these are key considerations. Uh, as a uh, solar company, uh, we, we, we care a lot about dollar per, per watt. It's basically uh, <laughs> that number, right? So the, the dollar basically means the performance, right? The higher efficiency. Uh, 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 sorry, I got it wrong, right? The, 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 the watt mean, means the uh, basically equivalent to the performance and sometimes we call it like, like efficiency and the other one is the cost, right? Is we need to really re reduce the cost all the ways because <clears throat> now, I mean, this, this, this industry has been very successful in the last uh, 15 years. Also, we have driven the cost down by more than uh, order of magnitude, right? Speak of performance, uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of like um, metrics we need to be aware of, such as film quality, uniformity, process control, monitoring, and also the reliability testing. All of those things, you know, when it comes to procure uh, equipment, either is a coating laser or or uh, all or in that metrology, those are things we, we need to be very mindful. Uh, on the cost side, right? So uh, we need a uh, 
think about the biomaterials, also the cost of equipment, right? A little bit cheap enough and also a, little, a lot of fast cycle time and uh, 90 percent or higher uptime and the excellent yield. We also, uh, if the tool is fully automated, then that would save the labor cost. And lastly, we also need to be very aware of the life cycle environmental footprint, such as you know, energy, water, uh, consumption, and carbon dioxide emission, and also sense like our recycling related issues. So basically that's what, what we would typically consider when it comes to, you know, uh, a process innovation and of course that could lead to a you know, equipment upgrade or entire new equipment. Yeah, that, that's my uh, six minutes pitch. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gang. That was uh, what we wanted to hear. And uh, I have to say, at Epic, we don't like to talk always about money, but I know that uh, that's what uh, pays off at the end of the day, right? <laughs> Yes. But, uh, so that's why we talk about optimization, and that is good. And uh, let's say from the list maybe that you put here, that is already a, a very good slide at the end. So photonics is, of course, a technology that you very well know. And um, about especially what we heard today, so metrology is a thing. So I would say that to drive you to be more efficient and cheaper, that is a word for written word, but we this time exceptionally use it. Photonics can help you. And maybe the diagnostic exactly that you have and that could be improved, can you maybe spend a couple of words there because of the key question, what can you do for them? What can they do for you? Maybe with some more details on reliability, on uh, inline, online, this is something that is always a question question how much has to be fast the response for the diagnostic maybe you can give us a couple of hints about it yeah muted now you were already ready and <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry yeah, no problem. yes uh, that, 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 that was a great question there are always uh, opportunities for for uh, you know, innovations here right for example you, you know um, it's very common for us to to dope a semiconductor, either P-type or N-type, sometimes the doping control is really critical. How, how do we actually measure the doping concentration, et cetera? Those are actually a lot easy uh, questions to, to, to answer. Um, other things, when, when, when we talk about particularly, right, so like uh, uh, five to seven years ago, uh, we, our our product that was uh, at a much smaller form factor, right? So, which was like a 60 by 120 centimeter. And now we, we transformed to series six, which is like a three times more, three times bigger, right? How to allow the uniformly coding and then how, how you, for example, how to still maintain the same fast cycle time, like, like how you scan the laser head rapidly enough to, to, to finish the scribe within uh, like a tenth of a second. So, those are challenges, right? So yes, uh, and we, uh, we closely work with our equipment vendors addressing those issues. And, and, uh, and from time to time, we may have to introduce new, uh, new equipment or new metrology. That's very interesting because that's what you want to hear always. And uh, that is, uh, there is some room of, of, of improvement. And uh, if nobody in, in house can help you, the idea is now, you know, Epic, you can send us the shopping list <laughs> afterwards. And if you have some more precise and maybe you don't want to tell everybody, but it's clearly that we, you told us already a bit of the topics of wh where photonics could help. And um, there is another point that we discussed offline, but maybe we can reconnect to your last point if I'm not. Um, wrong, you have to be also, and it makes totally sense, more environmental friendly as technology, right? So photovoltaic is always the, this uh, issue, let's say that uh, all these silly, the, the, the silly tube is always like uh, the, that uh, is the standard thing that people think it will be a lot of uh, hard to, to recover. And also I heard that uh, there is always, uh, there should be better use of materials that are not uh, so rare and so that should be a bit replaced with something that is a bit more environmental friendly. So what is your uh, approach on this? And maybe you can maybe specify a bit, you put something in the brackets, but maybe you can a bit uh, uh, explain what, uh, how you could become um, more environmental friendly, how photonics maybe can help you in this, if you have some couple of ideas. 
Well, so so we are the company who actually leading the 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 global PV uh, module recycling. So so we uh, uh, recycle all of our modules and we reuse uh, ninety to ninety five percent of of the material, in, including the the glass, right? So. Um, so the 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 couple of things you know, you know certainly you know we uh, we we can do right so so, so for, for for example uh, you you mentioned about the, the better utilization of the materials right so one classic example is like uh, we do a lot of uh, <clears throat> sputtering of for example the the, the compact materials right so uh, the utilization rate of target i think that's a key question I and mean, not only on, on the on the sustainability but maybe more is on the on the cost uh, <clears throat> re reduction right and also uh, from time time to time, when we're introducing new uh, like a new contact layers, for for example, right, we have to think about you know what's the impact uh, to 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 the recycling or or some, from time to time also uh, during the manufacturing process that does this um, uh, does this process uh, producing some. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> some some waste, right? And how do we capture that? And, and to a certain degree, not only is it, this is a question related how the material and how the process is going to be, but also those are questions that could, in the end, come to the equipment vendors, right? How how do we manage the <clears throat> the, the waste profile, right? How how do we reduce it, etc. Very good. So that is really important for us also to know because to be a, a let's say, be a renewable energy source, you have to be also friendly in every aspect of, of your manufacturing part. And so it's very good to know that uh, you were um, thinking about this. But uh, uh, now I see. One thing, uh, you know, sorry, one thing we should really be proud of ourselves, uh, you know, same film PV, it really has the lowest uh, environmental footprint. Uh, because you use less energy and use less material, et cetera. So it's lateral building. Very good to know. Very good to know. That's the way to go. So that's, uh, that's very good to know the first solar is also guiding other companies and the technology towards that direction. And uh, yeah, now, Haley, I've seen it. You have raised your hand from Plasma Quest. Thanks a lot for being today here. Please introduce yourself and ask your questions. You're very welcome. Thank you, Gam, for your very interesting talk. Um, I'm Hayley Brown from Plasma Quest, based in the UK. Um, and we have a novel, in, novel sputtering uh, technology that I thought you might be interested in, Gam. Um, you mentioned about high target utilization. Well, our brand name of our sputtering is called High Target Utilization Sputtering um, because we don't generate the plasma from the target. We remotely generate a plasma and we bend the plasma onto the target using electromagnets and we use the full target surface to sputter, um, we can get utilized target utilization about 90%. So I didn't wow. know if that was anything used. That, that, that's impressive. And uh, what about uh, what about the kinetic, kinetic energy of the ion species? What, not what, how many electron volt you're talking about? Um, so it's a, it's a low, um, low energy process but it's high density. So there's loads oh, of ions okay. available, but they, they don't cause that much damage. So oh. we can deposit <laughs> onto some very delicate materials. Um, but when the, the unique property of not generating the plasma from the target means that you can have independent control of the, of the variables of the plasma power and the power to the target. So you can, you can independently have um, like high power, high, high power to the target. So you've got a lot of material sputtered and then put low energy in via the plasma mm -hmm. um, for delicate substrates. Vice versa, you can put high energy into the plasma. So you get a very high energy deposition for very, um, for very dense coatings and very crystalline coatings, but low energy coming from the target for lower deposition rates. So you've got that extra variable that you can control. Well, this still mirrors uh, what, I, what you talked about, right? The, the low da low damage and also high utilization. I think I'm more than curious to know, find out more. Maybe we can discuss offline. That would be uh, good. Thank, thank you very you. much.
Yes. Finally, after one, an hour and 20 minutes, we hear the famous sentence, let's talk about it later. So that's the spirit. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Gang and, and Haley, for this. Uh, maybe, Haley, you can also give us another couple of words about what is maybe your needs in photonics, because that's what we always ask. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? So you can talk with Gang about what maybe can do the photonics community for you. Well, actually, um... We um, it's like the first talk with the, the PLD and actually analyzing the, the plasma um, and OES. Um, we, we need to know more about our process. Um, so we don't know like, about that like, ionized species and the, and the plasma flux. So if anybody can help us with that, that would be very useful. Diagnostic, eh? Diagnostics, what a, what a, what a beast. <laughs> That is very good to know that also for you is something relevant. Uh, I'm taking notes. And so all of you that are listening now uh, live or, or uh, not live should talk to Haley as well. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Haley. So if there are no other questions, it's time maybe to, to go to an EPIC member. <laughs> Frown of ILT. <laughs> it's maybe time for, I don't see you now. There you are, Christian. There you are. So now it's time for the theme films made in Germany. <laughs> now we had already other theme films made in Germany, so <laughs> I cannot say that. But um, if you switch exactly, the floor is yours. So it looks good, Christian. Please. <laughs> Yeah, hi and, and welcome. My name is uh, Christian Feder. I'm uh, head of group of uh, laser thin film processing and Fraunhofer ILT. And uh, I would like to uh, yeah, show some uh, things that we do here. So, um, yeah, we do laser process development. So we use the laser for um, heat treatment of, of layers, uh, for example, in the application areas like uh, for cleaning, deep painting, or pre-treatment. This is a very fast process. Uh, uh, so we can um, do the cleaning on very complex 3D parts, as you can see here. Um, but we can also do the pre-treatment on, on uh, substrate surfaces um, to later on print onto it. And that uh, is something I will show later on. We're also in the field of wear and corrosion resistance. So we use, for example, polymer-based uh, materials uh, that we use the laser to melt and uh, salt gel materials for wear and corrosion resistance. We have, we're in the field of printed electronics. So we can apply uh, very selectively gold contacts, for example, on, on metal substrates, or we can build up uh, layer by layer um, strain gauges or, or sensors. We're also in the field of microelectronics, where we, for example, selectively crystallize amorphous uh, silicon wafers, uh, or we can uh, uh, print uh, pure electric layers. Uh, I will show that later on. And we're also in the field of electromobility or energy sector, like uh, battery and, uh, and hydrogen, where we, for example, use the laser to just to dry uh, thick uh, layers or uh, yeah, uh, and I uh, will show an example later on too. So uh, the main approaches here are on the one hand that we um, yeah, modify the substrate surface or um, uh, modify the coating that is already on the substrate, which is perhaps already applied via CVD or PVD. And we can do a uh, crystallization or recrystallization or an activation uh, of these layers. And the other approach is that we um, put layers onto the substrate by printing and then using the laser for thermal post-treatment. And uh, we have some uh, yeah, printing uh, methods at EL ILT, like uh, inkjet printing and uh, screen printing and so on. And uh, we use the laser for the, uh, for the drying or debindering of these layers and the functionalization, which is uh, sintering or melting, cross-linking or crystallization. So uh, we also um, always aim on to uh, um, yeah, an inline process. So we have an inline production process where the part moves from left to the right. The first step could, for example, be a laser pretreatment uh, to, uh, yeah, for example, um, clean the substrate surface. Then we do the deposition and we get a wet coating on the substrate surface. 
And usually afterwards, we have a thermal treatment, which is conventionally done in an open process um, where uh, you, on the one hand, uh, laser dry uh, the, um, uh, the layer. So you evaporate uh, the, liquid, uh, the liquids in it, so the solvents, and then you have a functionalization process um, where you sinter or, or melt particles. And of course, you can go back to step two and deposit another layer on top of it and uh, get a multi-material or multi-layer system. So um, I mean, the main um, difference between uh, a furnace process and a laser process is, of course, the, the, uh, the amount of time that you need for uh, the activation. For example, an, an open process usually is in, in the range of minutes up to hours. Uh, it heats up the whole component. And the uh, laser uh, has the possibility to uh, selectively heat uh, the layer itself. And then you can also use uh, sensitive, um, uh, um, yeah, temperature sensitive uh, substrates. Um, this is the first example that I brought. Uh, it's um, the uh, application of different layers uh, on a silicon wafer to produce micro actuators. So uh, we have a platinized silicon wafer and we print using an uh, inkjet printer, um, uh, PZT layers and LNO layers. So uh, lead zirconate, uh, titanate and uh, lanthanum nickel oxide layers. So we have the piezoelectric layers and the electrodes uh, in between. And we use the laser for the crystallization process. And as you can see here, these layers are very thin. So uh, I think the, the whole multi-layer system is in the range of 500 to 600 nanometers. And each coating uh, is, uh, is a multiple coating. So uh, we're in the range of 30 to 40 nanometers um, per layer. And this is a multi-layer system already. And you can see that we can uh, uh, easily, not really easily, but we can uh, crystallize these uh, things. But there are some challenges. Uh, if you use the laser radiation optical energy and you want to uh, convert it into thermal energy, you're always dependent on the optical properties of the layer system. And if you have uh, very thin layers that are partially transmitting uh, radiation, you uh, have the problem of uh, the interaction of these, uh, uh, this radiation, which you can also see here in these graphs. And uh, that is uh, a problem if you have a one layer, two layer or three layer systems that you have a um, differing um, uh, absorbance. And uh, therefore, um, this uh, can be a problem during uh, laser um, yeah, processing. For us, the solution is a um, pyrometric-based laser power control. So we measure the, the uh, thermal uh, radiation and we control the, the laser power to counteract uh, uh, some um, yeah, alterations that, that uh, happen during the process. Um, another uh, short example is uh, from the hydrogen uh, um, applications. So uh, we're in the field of the membrane electrode assembly. We have the anode, the electrolyte, and the cathode. And we would like to uh, go thin film in these um, applications to, uh, to, to make, uh, for example, solid uh, oxide fuel cells work at lower temperatures and um, be able to cycle more. And in this first example, we have the uh, yttrium doped uh, barium uh, zirconate on a metallic uh, substrate. And these are, uh, this is a short comparison between rapid thermal annealing, which is already faster than uh, oven annealing, but you still have five minutes of interaction time. And the laser annealing, which is in our case below 100 microseconds. And as you can see, we can uh, um, form um, BZY in both cases, but uh, the laser is a little bit, uh, shows um, better results. Uh, but we can, um, by shortening the interaction time, we can uh, reduce uh, the uh, minor phases uh, in this case, which is uh, usually 
uh, obtained if you have long interaction times and uh, material diffusion. Um, so this is what we roughly do, and these are um, two very actual uh, and up-to-date um, applications. What we look for uh, are, of course, partners uh, for uh, yeah, new application areas or problems to be solved, of course. Um, we often uh, are searching for um, people in the field of uh, material development, especially in nanoparticulate inks. Uh, I, uh, uh, we see that uh, this is uh, a rather difficult part uh, in, uh, to industrialize nanoparticle technical inks uh, that can be used with a uh, laser radiation. Because usually you carbonate the, uh, the auxiliary materials that are in these uh, inks. And we are always looking for partners for online measurement modules for residual moisture, for example, or measuring layer thickness and uh, thickness homogeneity. Yeah, thank you very much. This was my short contribution and uh, I'm happy. Uh... You're happy, but also to answer yeah. questions, no, right? There was a little <laughs> start. I thought I was, I was thrown out. I'm happy for the discussion, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Christian. Thanks a lot. Yeah, of course. <laughs> So that it was a nice introduction, and uh, as as usual, yeah, I've seen it uh, diagnostic. Eh? So in the end, you had a, a nice story. Always about diagnostic. <laughs> yeah. The fast that, processes are always uh, hard to uh, yeah, to observe. No, no, but that's uh, that's what uh, we really love to hear, and so that is uh, definitely a good a good mark to remember for us. And uh, what is maybe something that I wanted to say is, of course, I don't think at the Fanofer ILT you need someone uh, that provides you the lasers, but <laughs> maybe something that you can tell us is a bit the kind of lasers that you use for all this processing. Uh, you didn't mention like like wavelengths; you don't need to be too precise, but at least which kind of uh, um, if they are pulsed, if they are CW, which kind of wavelength that are may be important for all the steps, just that mm -hmm. the laser people have uh, an idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a wide range of, of laser uh, wavelength uh, that we use. For example, if we try um, um, electrodes for the batteries, uh, um, we use uh, um, aerial emitters like Vixels at 980 nanometers or diode lasers. Um, we have uh, um, 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 quite often uh, um, fiber lasers that we use around one micron. Sometimes we use uh, CO2 lasers, but uh, with the we have some systems from uh, coherent at our place uh, in the Exima range, and um, these are quite uh, yeah good in, for, for materials that are uh, hardly uh, absorbing any radiation in the in the usual. Uh, or low cost regime <laughs> uh, laser. Uh, okay. Region. And yeah. what about mid IR? Because we heard before, I mean, uh, Femtum is not the only uh, provider of uh, these wavelengths, but maybe you need also something compact, QCLs. Is something that uh, is any, in any range possible or useful for you? Mid range is very interesting because uh, we have these uh, organics that, when, that we need to get out uh, and, and the solvents. And I think there are some uh, absorption bands that are really interesting for, for mid-range uh, laser radiation. Very good. Still for uh, then like post-processing or any way, um, taking care of the quality of then of the process and of the thin films, right? Okay, yeah. that's uh, very good. There we have also broad uh, community in Epic. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, we are very welcome to, to talk to you. Then uh, and maybe another couple of, of comments about the diagnostics that you mentioned at the end, compared to what you heard so far from the other technology, of course, PLD is uh, something else, but uh, in your case, the pyrometric based technology is something that satisfies you completely or is it, there is something more, right? Because you put it in the, in the shopping list, let's say, but maybe you can give us a couple of coordinates on what is that you're looking at. So online, yes, I get it. And, uh, but then if, is there something else that you would like to have as a, as a plus, uh, let's say, or as, as a goodies? <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, Please, uh, I was going to ask a question. 
Ah, okay, yeah, okay. okay. Then, then, then we have a lot of people now. Everybody's awake. And maybe <laughs> it's uh, it's not 6 a.m. in US anymore, also for Central European time. So <laughs> maybe uh, Christian gives an answer, and then we have a couple of questions. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so measure, measures, uh, measurement methods that are online and uh, that we can use to, to control the, the laser process are always uh, very good for us. So um, the residual moisture, for example, in, in drying these battery electrodes is, is very interesting. And of course, we can already measure the thickness of the layer because printing processes are always a little bit uh, different. If we can um, measure them in advance and already have a, a, yeah, a control of the laser power uh, or know about how to, to work with it, it's always better because if we measure the, 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 the temperature, it's already happened. So <laughs> a little, bit, little time in advance uh, would, would be better. Yeah. I see. Now that's, that's good to know. So maybe then we give the word to Gang and then your raise hand are there, so I won't forget. Gang, please ask your question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I apologize again. Uh, so speak of the, the uh, surface pretreatment, right? So how is this laser uh, technique uh, different from uh, uh, traditional thermal, thermal desorption or, 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 or just uh, photon desorption? How is this different? Um, for us, we can, uh, for example, uh, have an impact on the uh, absorbance of the substrate surface. So if you have an alum aluminum uh, substrate and you uh, make a, a pretreatment, you can ri uh, rise or you can uh, increase the uh, absorbance and uh, therefore um, um, couple the or, or bring in the energy uh, into the layer that it's above from from the bottom. So this is, for example, one one kind of uh, of uh, having uh, an impact on your laser process afterwards. And for of course, uh, if you have a very uh, strong structuring of the surface, you can um, have a very uh, rough surface. And um, if we take these polymeric uh, um, layers, they have some uh, interlocking, mechanical interlocking, for example. So this is very interesting for us. Thank you. Gang, if you want to use more lasers, you are at the right place, I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you I can already know that. <laughs> now you know for sure. Yes. <laughs> So Christian has a lot of friends uh, in, uh, in Aachen, uh, where he is, but uh, there are also many other friends in the community that, of course, if they hear that you would like to a bit uh, go deeper into how, how lasers are better than usual thermal sources, I believe we have a lot of arguments <laughs> and, and topics to support you in this. So let's keep in touch <laughs> also for this. Then I go back to the raise hand. So David? You have a reason, innovation. You know that before it was a mistake, but now it seems like it's real. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> David, please, maybe you introduce a bit yourself and then you can ask your question as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dave Rogers. I'm one of the founders of Nanovation. So we're a PLD manufacturer as well. We use it to make um, oxide semiconductors, mostly for optoelectronic applications. Yeah, so um, I was very interested by your talk on, on the laser processing. I had some technical questions very quick. Do you do you, do you use beam homogenizing systems and is it complicated? Do you shape the beam? Is it really important to have a top hat? And do you find the incidence angle is important? And finally, another kind of side question is, what about using lamps instead of lasers? Would that work in the similar way? <laughs> uh, yeah, where do I start? Uh... Sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> top hat versus uh, Gaussian. Um, yeah, it is in some cases very important to have a, a top hat uh, intensity profile. Sometimes even have a, a square instead of a round uh, beam um, to have a more homogeneous temperature uh, yeah, radi uh, gradient in, in, in the substrate or in, in the in the layer. Um, so this is uh, quite important to deploy the thermal energy in a very homogeneous way. 
So if you go a step further, if you think about inline processing, uh, line beams are always of interest. Uh, if you can um, yeah, m manipulate or process your material in a, in a one step uh, process, uh, line beams are always interesting in this case because you don't have to stitch uh, uh, um, yeah, paths to each other. So you have a continuous process. And why not lamps? Okay, <laughs> lamps have a, like um, flash lamps have a very, are very advantages if you have um, big areas. And uh, if you, uh, big areas that needs, uh, that need to be irradiated. And if you don't have anything uh, besides it, that is, um, Problematic, so you can also use it in in row to row process processes for RFID printing, for example. They are used, but if you want to go very uh, selective uh, and, and and very um, yeah, really selective on on your uh, um, component, and you want to um, reduce the thermal impact on the on the substrate, uh, lasers are very good in the first case. And the second case, of course, you have a very narrow wavelength that is dedicated to a certain uh, task. And if you have a broad wavelength, like a flash lamp, uh, sometimes you have uh, uh, not so, uh, or more unwanted uh, um, yeah, results in that case. Thank you. I hope I, I got all your answers. Yeah, I also lost track. So, David, you know better. <laughs> Did you answer everything? <laughs> All good. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks a lot. And uh, uh, maybe you, I see now, yeah, we have a second David. So, Polly Rice was also David. Good that you didn't uh, overlap yourself and you understood. So, maybe, David, you can also introduce yourself, the company, and your question. There you are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm David, working for Polly Rice. Uh, we are uh, a soil gel based uh, company. So since uh, 2006, we have developed uh, anti-reflective coating based on soil gel technology. And uh, it allows us to, uh, to ac address uh, mass market with this uh, uh, very uh, high speed uh, process. So obviously we don't uh, uh, provide the same perf optical performances as you can do with uh, multiple layers. But with uh, or one layer, we can uh, uh, yeah we can access uh, big market like uh, automotive lighting and headlamps, for instance. So it's very good to see. It was very interesting to see this uh, uh, um, curing technology or curing process you are doing with a laser. It's mm -hmm. uh, very prom promising to have an online technology, uh, and um, yeah, it's good. Thank you. Very good. So then we know another new friend. So David didn't say it, but I believe you can keep in contact offline later, right? Yes, that is what you wanted to say. That's what she's waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> he was too shy. David was too shy. When he said, oh Gang, Gang was more straightforward. <laughs> okay. So it seems like, yeah, we are on a good track. So Christian, you uh, surprised everybody. You had a good, good things to propose. So I hope we can get some contacts today yourself, or if you need some help for sure i'm happy to to support you also offline to connect to some of the people here in the room that they would like to a bit de go deeper into the topics and uh, yeah, thank you very much thanks a lot yeah, yeah so i guess we can move on we can get to the a bit more traditional eh? you were expecting from the title that we would have talked only about optical uh, thin films but we didn't do only this but uh, last but not least we have also <laughs> labeled optics as a subgroup of Buller in the room so i'm really happy to uh, give the floor now to daniel who, and uh, if you want to share your screen there is it goes the floor is can yours you, can you hear me now <laughs> we can hear you and you yeah, can go perfect. on uh, on presentation perfect. mode, I guess, yeah. perfect. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the, the, the introduction. I will introduce you a little bit to Bueller and to Libeled Optics in, in particular before moving on to uh, why we're here today and what we are doing in the semiconductor business. Uh, so Bueller is a Swiss company. It's a family-owned Swiss company. And you might not be totally aware, but uh, in your day-to-day, -day, um, you, come, you come in contact in one way or another to, to, to Bueller. 
So we specialize in selling machines for all sorts of applications. And uh, yeah, that, those applications can be in the food industry for uh, production of uh, rice and pasta to uh, milling solutions for, for grains to uh, high-end machines for all sorts of technological applications. At uh, Bueller Liable Optics in particular, we specialize in uh, 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 machines for thin film vacuum coating. Um, and uh, we, um, for all sorts of op uh, optics and photonics applications, and with a turnover of above uh, 200 million Swiss, Swiss francs. Yeah, so we are a Swiss company, so we, we talk in Swiss francs. Uh, and uh, roughly 3.5 thousand uh, systems installed and 400 employees. We are present all around, all around the world. Uh, but uh, we have three competence centers uh, in the world. So one here in Alzenau, in Germany, where I'm talking you from, talking with you from, uh, one in China, and one in the in in the US. So uh, when it comes to our product portfolio, uh, we cover all sorts of applications in the optics and photonics fields. For example, uh, we talk about machines capable of uh, producing anti-reflect reflection coatings, high reflectivity layers. Um, can you see my can you see my mouse? I think uh, yeah, hope so. Um, we do, we do. It's not yeah, super bright, you. but this is okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so here in this in this first block, we're talking about anti scratch, anti smudge, and anti fog protection layers for for glasses. We talk about a high end functionalization of telescope mirrors as well, for example. Then if we move on to uh, to automotive applications, uh, it's uh, a lot about metallization of head and tail lights, decorative interior or uh, energy glazing uh, options. Then we also talk, if we go to this block here, uh, about uh, energy saving solutions for large area, roll to roll uh, facilities. And in finally, in the precision optics and semiconductor uh, areas, we talk about functionalizing um, wafers and functionalizing substrates with, with uh, uh, filters and beam splitters for all sorts of uh, applications as well. Across all of these, we offer as well uh, customer service solutions and this slide to, to answer the first epic question, what we can do for you. Um, and uh, yeah, so I would like to focus a little bit on the, on the semiconductor side of things and introduce you to our Helios series. So we have two, uh, two Helios machines, the Helios 800 for uh, substrates up to 200 millimeters and the Helios uh, 1200 for th uh, 300 millimeter uh, solutions. This is a sputtering machine capable of uh, producing uh, versatile uh, uh, filters on, on all sorts of substrates, which include also uh, silicon wafers and pattern, patterned uh, wafers. And uh, uh, we have the possibility of having uh, variable deposition rates and uh, the variable deposition temperatures, which also includes low deposition temperatures for accommodation with photolithography processes. We can have uh, high material flexibility and target util utilization. And our systems are also coupled with uh, in-situ optical mo monitoring for um, monitoring of the process uh, while it's happening. Uh, that allows us to improve the repro reproducibility and uf uniformity of our filters and also course correct uh, the, the process if something um, deviates. And because we're talking about semiconductor, both of these machines are uh, uh, capable of producing filters with low particle level, and they also accommodate different wafer, wafer handling solutions, all the way from Smith uh, or FOOP uh, loaders to single substrates. And here in these plots below, uh, I would like to uh, highlight just what we can do with our, um, with our Helio series. Um, on the plot on the left, you can see just uh, an example of our of our uh, of a filter that we can produce with our Helios, and uh, the highlight is how little it changes when you when you change the angle of incidence. So the the performance can be uh, well maintained uh, at different angles of incidence, and this really highlights the capabilities of the Helios. And um, on the on the right, you see. Uh, other sort, sorts of functionalization you can add to the filters by uh, looking into a, a DBR with and without uh, ITO. So you can add other, other levels of, of uh, functionalization by without affecting the optical performance. And with all of this, uh, we aim to, 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 to feed the market by uh, in terms of applications such as ambient light sensing, we we'll talk about 3D sensing and Im imaging. And uh, we've been seeing a lot, uh, a lot of interest in hyperspectral imaging as well. 
so if this has phrased your interest, I really, really recommend you you check our our webinar. It's already available online, and it uh, introduces a, a little bit more to to the Helios machines. Now to go to the second uh, Epic question. So what uh, can Epic members do for us? And uh, we are always looking to to uh, to engage uh, with uh, with with uh, other people in the, in the photonics and optics business because we want to challenge our capabilities for the deposition of optical layers. So every time you have a, a, a filter design or an idea that you would like to see if you could, if uh, uh, we can build a, a, a filter out of it, please feel free to come to us. Uh, we also uh, uh, would like to understand where the, the photonics industry is heading. So to try to understand more, a little bit more about uh, new applications and uh, where the, 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 the industry is heading. Um, we talk, we think a lot about cooperation with R&D centers as well. And there's a very good example. We have our cooperation with IMAC where uh, uh, Helios 800 is installed. And not only we've we've had the opportunity of get our tool empowered for uh, in the semiconductor field, we also had uh, we also were able to provide with it, with the tool for 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 testing and for to to learn about new applications. And finally, we also look into integrating your own photonic technologies and your own your your own products into our into our machines to make it to make it smarter. And we talked a lot about uh, today about metrology, so this is something that that is interesting for us and uh, and so on and so forth. So this is basically it. I end up here. Uh, thank you very much. I'm. I think I'm on time, so we still have a few minutes to talk about. Absolutely, Daniel. Yeah. You're on time, and <laughs> it was great to to hear from you. So, as you understand, Buller is a big family with a lot of things. So that's why we wanted to be friends with Daniel. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> starting from photonics, eh, we have to talk about optics as well and uh, the position. So I know eh, you heard it. I know you edited the end of the slide. You heard all day talking about diagnostics. So do you have maybe something more specific that you would like to tell the photonics um, uh, community about that? So Yeah, so yeah? Um, it's actually more mostly about uh, I put it in two ways. One of, of them being more in line, uh, in line metrology, and the other one uh, something else entirely. But it's more about identifying, for example, where um, when our wafers are positioned in, in uh, appropriately, and if there is like a deviation within within the the, the 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 position. This is one one way to go. Another way to go is, for example, in a further integration with. Uh, uh, with wafer handling, uh, so we have our wafer handling uh, in place, but uh, integration with other with other other uh, known systems is also something that we 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 look uh, a lot to. Our, uh, to. muted myself sorry <laughs> uh, this is what i actually noticed one of your bullet points was more towards like uh, industry 4.0 is it something that is also so the last thing also you mentioned to more to be a bit more uh, automatized right exactly, is it also exactly, yeah exactly, in which exactly. phase of the of the line would be this uh, the, your your dream let's say uh, mostly in the the very beginning so uh, automation and connection to our to our um, to our machine Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, we have options available, but we're always looking into into further exploring those. Okay, that sounds like a very good plan. Then let's say talking about optics, of course I have I have a task today, and I have the task to talk about Fabulous. <laughs> that now I will do myself because otherwise it's uh, it's bad for me if I don't. Otherwise I get uh, really kicked by my colleague. So. This is now it doesn't want to go in presentation mode, but uh, you see it right yeah now okay. <laughs> so fabulous talking about optics and micro optics and free from optics <laughs> and everything that also maybe okay you at Bular, you are a bit too big for this and you don't need to prototype and to scale up and ramp up your production but there are someone here in the room that maybe needs some funding and some support and in the, with this pilot line where epic is also involved we are really trying to support um, and he will be here you have all the coordinates like uh, 20 we have 3 million euros uh, and at, at our disposal, at your disposal, actually, as a budget. Is it possible to resubmit also different applications? But the idea is 
if you have a design idea or a prototype and you want to really go to pilot production in the field of um, micro optics, free from optics with all these applications. So you see, for example, in decoration, AR, VR, that I know there are a couple of guys here in the room and in YouTube interested in it, images and display. I know some of those who sign up were also interested in this, transportation, automotive, consumer electronics, everything is an opportunity to get some support from the European Commission and then uh, get into pilot production and maybe who knows be successful really. These are just the, the, the partners here you have the, the coordinates, the, the two colleagues that are working on this uh, from the technical side are Panagiotis and Jeremy. So you remember the couple of guys I show you at the beginning. So in any case, if you need any questions, you can contact me, but these are the guys, these are, this is the place to go if you wanna get some support and get into your pilot production. So let's see something. I have to say so. But then there is another thing. We are almost done. And now, of course, my, 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 my PowerPoint is dying. <laughs> so I cannot show you the slide. No, come on. Is that this is like uh, terrible. Uh, no, now I'm back. Sorry. Eh? But uh, basically, when we get at this point, we wrap up a bit. And this is very important. And this is something that uh, I always envy in, in Ose that can do this uh, very easily. Uh, I cannot do it that easily, but I tried my, the best I could do <laughs> for this. So I will show you here a little bit the summary of what we talk about today. And then, of course, you are free to give comments, write me privately, lively. Uh, it's up to you. So it's not a secret that uh, what is the topic of today, what everybody needs is diagnostics. <laughs> So I put it just up there, but it is something that we heard it more or less everybody of you. So I don't feel that I miss something if I uh, without writing all the details, but diagnostic is there also for for Daniel at the end. So it's nothing that is bad. But um, for the PLD in particular, eh, we heard about inline, but also possibly online uh, diagnostic of the plume to define, for example, absorption and the fluence and the growing substrate. Then we saw that we need simulations. Eh? some guys that uh, maybe we're missing today, but uh, they are in the um, EPIC community. Uh, they are new, they're really useful for forecast of growth deposition and related uh, specs of the growing film. So this is uh, important to have. And then, yeah, well, we know we don't want to talk about money, but that is what we, uh, some of you need. So most, more, most efficient um, cost to pulse of the laser sources, but also related to the bin delivery system. So that's uh, good to hear. Then from the solar technology, of course, they want to be competitive. Uh, we support this strongly, so it's good that they also get um, a better cost per watt um, efficiency and to be optimized. They need diagnostic as well, so we heard that the gang was really fascinated by the, all the technology on processing and diagnostic that with laser are possible, so um, we hope that we talk about it again soon in the future. So you talk about the uniform, for example, the thin quality refer to uniformity, improve environmental footprint. This is also something that maybe photonics can help you as well, and also to define the doping concentration, for example, in the thin films, new materials, this we heard it as well, nanoparticle inks, right? And, and then concerning the film processing, I, I a bit asked Christian, he gave a couple of uh, wish lists. So media IR sources are something that uh, are always good for, uh, for the community. And then I didn't say it, but the beam shaping, my God, because there are not enough people here in the room because let's say diagnostic and beam shaping, I keep hearing every day. So it's good that our EPIC members that can also support you with this. Uh, for this, we can also talk offline because there is, of of course, the, the, let's say the competition top head Gaussian or also squared spot, there are uh, still a debate, but maybe the beam shaper experts of my of our network can really can really help you. And so with this, do you have any comment? Is it fine? Can I pass the exam? <laughs> Did I miss anything that is in mind that is a big is a big challenge? Because if it's not the case, or if you're just too shy to tell the mistakes I did, you can write me offline. <laughs> and then I will post this slide with the, all the things you would like me to, to write about, because this is something that we have to keep in mind. This will go also on YouTube and uh, the people that are not today with us uh, watching or could interact with you could be maybe in the future. So my... Um, let's say wish is that you can uh, stay in contact with all the people you met today, those that are more interesting. If you need help, of course, let us know because Epic is here for this and myself as well. So I 
think I wish we, we had a great discussion. So I guess we did. If there is something still offline that can go on, I'm really happy to support this. And I guess I can say goodbye from all Epic. And we see each other, I guess, yes, yeah, soon for other online events, but also for the next technology meetings next, uh, next you know, in two Mondays. We try to be on Photonics at Photonics West. So if you are in San Francisco and we all manage to be tested negative <laughs> and meet there, that's a good opportunity. Otherwise, see you online soon. And bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>